Hello and welcome. This is a new show where we're doing a two-part series of the Did You Know episodes with myself and Fernando Delgado. Fernando, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Tom. How are you? I'm doing okay, not too bad. What are we doing today for everyone? So we are discussing today uh, some of the very basic concepts of our autocot systems. Uh, for that, I've got a couple of consoles here. Uh, we'll be running some slides as well to show people some uh, details. And I suppose you're going to be helping me at your end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to have an SD Mini Rack, SD Rack and SD Nano. Um, because uh, today is really the first part and we are going over the basics. Okay, So we're going to go revisit our optical system. We're going to show uh, the SD Rack. Uh, we're going to show you some basic operation of the SD Rack as well. And then we're going to guess, go straight into some examples of some sing single console setups, as well as what you want to look for in dual console setups across our OptiCore system. Now, this is a two-part series. This is idea around being a basic episode. Tune in for our second episode, which is going to be a more advanced look into some uh, extra details, because you can see I have an orange box at the top. I've got an S21 in front of me. So we will be looking at how to get Orange Box integrated onto an optical loop, as well as going through extensively the LCD menu on the SD racks and SD mini racks. So, what's the first port of call, Fernando? So what 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 I want to show first is what we're going to be looking at today, because we are going to be covering a lot in this two uh, video series. Okay, but today we are going to be mainly focused on uh, these four main concepts: uh, the loop the optical IDs, the optical mapping, and clocking. And as you said, we will move on, on to some examples after that. Okay, so to start with, Tom, I want to share with my friends out there what the concept of the optical loop is. So basically what I've got there, as you can see, is a ring, uh, which uh, is kind of the connections. Let's put, let's put it that way. That's just the connections, okay? And on that loop, I'm going to seat two devices. I'm going to start with a Q5, because I really like it, and with the stage rack, which is the minimum optical system we can have, one console and one rack. As you can see, i got connections to the left and to the right of each of the devices, and that's the loop. That means we have full redundancy on the cabling. If I lose one of the cables, the audio won't stop, and that is great. Also, the loop is really powerful. It can have many devices sitting on it. So, for example, I've got a monitor SD10. I might have also an SD11 running the, uh, the matrix output. Why not a Q7 for the television feed? So I have a broadcast uh, Q7. And I still have some space, so I can have an SD9 doing all the recordings. So that's the console end. And I'm sure you can talk about the racks. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, just staying on that image uh, to begin with. All five of those consoles can actually see that one stage box. And what uh, the, the great thing about the optical system is each one of those consoles could have an individual output card assigned to it as well. So from a very basic setup, that is what you need. One console and a stage box, but as you can see with multiple consoles, you can still be sharing that input and output information across those five desks. Now, on top of that single stage box, we can add in some more. So we can actually connect up to 14 stage boxes inside one optic loop. Now that's pretty powerful and that's a redundant connection as well. So you can have up to five redundant desks, 10 consoles essentially, and 14 stage boxes. Now that provides 504 channels of audio per optic loop and we can actually have two optic loops installed into the back of our consoles. So that gives you 1,008 channels of audio that you can potentially be sourcing from and to. So it's an incredibly flexible and powerful system. I mean, how many devices is that on the loop there, Fernando? Uh, well, we can actually have two loops. That means 28 racks and up to 10 consoles. So that's another. So that's 38, actually. That's crazy, isn't it? That yeah. is crazy. But I wonder how we are. Are we going to identify each device so they are independent? So I want you to run through our next topic, Tom which will be cool. the IDs. Yes. yes, so for such a large network uh, or such a large uh, setup, each device is going to have to have a, a unique uh, ID or identifying number, so um, everything knows where everything else is, essentially. So the system uses 24 IDs. 
and these are reserved for desks and racks separately. So IDs 1 to 10 are exclusively for your consoles, IDs 11 to 24 are exclusively for your stage boxes. So as shown on screen, you'll see that 1, 3, 5, 7 and 9 in terms of those ID numbers are used for the main mixing engines. So if you have a redundant engine next to your main mixing engine, these are provided with the adjacent even number, so the 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10. So if you only have one console and a stage box, then you will be looking to assign an odd number. Only use the even number if you have a, a redundant engine, like you would be thinking about using for a, a Quantum 7. So as you'll see on screen, you'll see some IDs populating across the consoles. So the Quantum 5 will have an ID of number 1, uh, the SD10 would have an ID of number 3, SD11 would have the ID of number 5, the SD9 would have the ID of number 7. Remember these are single engine consoles, so there's no even number associated with them. But we get to the Quantum 7 at broadcast. Quantum 7 has two engines installed into the back of it. It is the stalwart of our industry. It has done all your big shows. So, um, you know, the, the, the reputation and the coveted aspect of this console knows no bounds, essentially. We need to assign two IDs to this desk. ID number 9 and ID number 10. So engine A would be ID number 9. Engine B would be ID number 10. So in the optical system, if ID9 disappears for any reason, ID10 will then take over all responsibilities within one sample, which is pretty, pretty powerful, isn't it, Fernando? Yes, Tom. So that means that if I want to add a, another mirror console for the uh, front of house position, I should use ID number two, shouldn't I, Tom? Uh, correct, yes. So two, S, uh, two quantum fives, um, you have ID number one and ID number two. So um, you'll now notice that the racks will populate with IDs now. Um, and again, all you're going to be doing is leaving them within the range of 11 to 24. So no extra rules or anything to think about here. Um, so if you only have, say, three racks like I have today, uh, you could choose an ID range between those 14 numbers. OK, so we know that optical works in a loop. Um, it works bidirectionally as well, but the loop provides us redundancy. All of the devices are uniquely ID'd as well. But how does all this audio information actually get managed? Well, this is done via the optical mapping section. Okay. So the optical mapping essentially works as you can see from the diagram. I would explain this in uh, a few words. So the racks take audio in from external sources and then insert them onto the loop. Uh, so the consoles then extract this audio, which becomes input into the console. So the map tells each device on the loop which fibre channels it is using or accessing, either to insert audio onto the loop or extract audio from this loop. So consoles will route the signals out to the loop, so you're sending it out onto the loop, um, and racks extract this to route out to the external devices. Okay, So this is kind of how the uh, communication works between the devices. In order for this mapping to work effectively, every device must be aware of every other device on the loop. So for example, SD consoles within the audio I.O. page, all consoles on that loop must list every rack connected. Okay, so as, is, as has been explained, every, the optical system needs to know where all your signals are currently positioned. Now that can be hopefully broken down into simpler terms via that little roundabout that we can see on the left hand side. So the roundabout is the loop, you know, that's our optic loop. Each junction can be treated as a device, a connecting device. And then the cars, as you can see, are the individual signals. So all devices know where the signals are going within the optical loop. Fernando, do you want to add anything uh, onto the mapping at all? Uh, well, the mapping is done. I uh, was just what I want to add. Uh, yes, we do have lots of devices that we need to uh, get to agree to each other with the mapping. But obviously, there is one thing thing that is extremely important when we are mixing so many digital devices and that would be the clocking Tom. Uh, I just want to point out how cool the clocking is uh, in our optical system. It's a self-negotiating uh, uh, system they use in which always the lowest ID has the control. Every device in the loop is clocked to optical. So automatically the system detects when the lowest ID is no longer there, it will switch to the next lowest ID. So that is just 
great, but it's even easier if you need to use an external clock because you don't need to distribute that clock. You just need to apply to one of our racks and automatically the entire loop will sync, will lock to that external clock. And it's just simple, reliable, and it's great. I just love it, Tom. It's fantastic. It's very quick and efficient, isn't it? Um, so as you can see on uh, where I'm pointing right now, this is where the work clock BNC port would be. Um, now again, you could connect external work clocks up to a console as well. We are very, very flexible from that point of view, but this has been designed to make it as efficient and quick and easy as possible. Maybe you're just working with a broadcast or something and they need to bring in their own work clock. Don't have to worry about ruining any of your own existing setups. You just plug those in and voila, it will automatically start clocking from that new input source. So, um, Regarding uh, optical clocking, we would set this on the audio sync page and you obviously want to make sure that everything is clocking to the same clock source. Um, so we will be having a good look at that in our examples as we're doing down the line. What we, uh, what we did up to next, Fernando? Well, now that you have mentioned uh, where to connect the external clock and you have shown on the rack, why don't, take, why don't we take a look uh, at the menus and the hardware on the rack? Uh, I think the SD rack is probably the best rack in the market, to be honest. Uh, it's extremely powerful. It can have up to 56 inputs and 56 outputs, dual redundant PSUs, a very large MADI connectivity. I mean, it's got four MADI outputs, Tom. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh, that's great. We can feed four devices with the same inputs. That is great. But then on top of that, we have the optical connectivity, which it's just, you know, it's just amazing. It's, a, it's an incredible device. Now, three extra bits of information there as well, if I may. You know, you've got hot, swap hot swappable uh, I.O. modules, hot swappable uh, power supplies, as well as gain tracked MADI split outputs as well. So all you broadcasters out there probably already know how useful this win uh, box is. But uh, if you didn't, um, those are just three extra little uh, facts there for you. Yeah, how cool is to be able to add a card without without having to stop the audio, and that that's just that's just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I can show you a little bit more of the rack, Tom, because I've got a better view of the brain. That's what we normally call the muddy pot, and I'm sure as you have a rack there, you can run through it. Yeah. So up on the screen, you have starting from the top left this LCD menu with these four buttons around them. Uh, we will show you how to integrate with this menu. Um, there's some basic operation as well as some advanced operation for this. As you guessed it, today is the basic one. So I will show you two important things to know about this LCD menu in terms of setting up to core ID and resetting your your uh, rack. Um, but before I get there, the rest of the ports that we have available are the MADI BNC ports. So you have a MADI main and MADI auxiliary, as well as extra MADI split outputs, allowing you for 48 or 96 kilohertz operation there. Uh, one extra thing I will add as well, we do have sample rate conversion on those MADI ports as well. So we can actually be going from 96 to 48K from these two ports, which again, amazing. Um, and then on the top right, we have our optic HMA connectors on this particular example. You can have the other optic styles of connector installed there as well. Next to our right hand side MADI split, we have a USB port. This will allow you to look at firmware updates as well as setting up external control software or using this uh, remotely. Um, and then you have your word clock BNC. So, as I've already shown you, this is where you would plug into your external word clock source. Okay, now the LCD menu provides the gateway to many solutions. Definitely many, you know, no, no, no problems at all, um, which is why originally it is locked, so you can't accidentally get in there. But I'm going to show you how you can get into this window and then set some basic options. So, first of all, what do we want to do? We want to go and set up an optic ID, so setting the ID of our stage box. Now, like I mentioned, this when menu is locked, so you cannot accidentally change the settings until it is unlocked. So what you need to do is press and hold roughly for about two seconds, and then the menu will lock itself. Now, to set the optical ID, you scroll down, and then you get into the next menu. It's pretty simple from that point of view, and straightforward. You use your left and right arrow keys to then go through your optic ID range. Obviously, make sure that if you have multiple racks connected, 
they're not all on the same optic ID, otherwise they won't be working, but this is how you will get in to change that ID. After you've finished, you can go back up to the main menu by pressing up once. So that's how you set the ID of an individual stage box. Now, the next option is to look at the resetting of the rack as well. So as much as we want to uh, rely on all your vendors and all, you, uh, <laughs> and all your rental houses and stuff out there, but maybe as an end user, you might get a rack that needs to be reset, might have some head amp gain information stored from a previous gig in. To do this, we're going through the same operation. We're going to unlock the menu if it hasn't been unlocked already, and then we're going to now go into the main menu and go up one. Okay, so this is where we get to the resetting of the rack. What is quite useful is there is a are you sure kind of second step to confirm before you reset everything, um, because uh, as the name suggests, it will reset a whole host of um, uh, things that have been applied, for example, pads and stuff. We've got another, we, we can show that in a bit more detail, can't we there, Fernando? Yes, indeed. The things that we are going to be getting rid when we reset, we're going to be getting rid of when we reset the rags are the gain settings, the phantom power, the output attenuators or pads, and any settings on the MADI cards, uh, or the splits, uh, the, med, the, the splits, uh, MADI splits or ca uh, card splits. That's something we are going to be looking at uh, with more detail in our next video, I believe, Tom, the MADI and card splits. But yes, so everybody knows that's one of the things you can reset with that button. So those are the four main things we're going to be getting rid of, yes. Yeah, great, cool. Um, so in terms of basic operation, you don't need to know any more than that for now. Um, and that, I believe, concludes what we had uh, for you guys to follow with us. So what are we going to go do now then, Fernando? I think we are ready to do some examples, Tom. So we can, I've got my SC10 ready, my audio I.O. page is opened, and I'm just waiting for you to start connecting racks so we can show our friends out there what happens. Always waiting for me to connect the racks. It sounds, yes. uh, sounds pretty, pretty standard <laughs> there. Um, so I've got my SD Mini, SD... Uh, rack and SD Nano, um, and we'll go and crack on and start connecting them. So now we are going to be looking at some examples. Uh, I will be asking Tom to connect some of the racks, and uh, we will be looking at what happens at the console end. Uh, I've got my audio IO page opened, and uh, Tom, could you connect one of the racks so we can see what happens? I've got my optical port B used for that. Excellent. Um, so yeah, top tip there, always make sure you connect to uh, the opposite letters essentially. So A to B, A to B, or B to A, B to A. Um, smashing. So you're in B, I'm going to go into A, and I'll just let you know what the side is. So the, the first thing you will see when you connect that is that the LCD will start flashing green. That means... Almost took the words out of my mouth. So yeah, absolutely, it's just started flashing there, Fernando. Perfect. That means the console can see the rack. It's obviously not been added to my session just yet, but that's what we're going to do right now. So, in my audio IO page, IO page, I've got top left my port. As you can see, I've got my local IO, which is permanently installed in the console. I've got one MADI port. We are not talking about MADI, so we will leave that for another day. I have a waves port and nothing more. Now I'm going to discover the rack that's been connected. So what I'm going to press is the button conform all ports. Okay, that will add my rack to the session. And I can see perfectly that is a, a mini rack with the ID number 16. As you can see, my traffic light is telling me it's okay, it's connected. The device is telling me it's a mini rack. I got some red letters here that we will be discussing in a minute. So can you continue? Connecting some more racks. Of course, two seconds. What I like about the green LCD uh, flashing is that it will allow you to take a look from the other end of the stage and make sure all things are running up and smoothly. So I quite like it. And uh, while you connect, Tom, it's worth mentioning that uh, the distance between nodes can be as uh, as high as tw uh, 350 meters so yeah that's absolutely right so in multi-mode uh, you can have up to 350 meters 
and then in single mode that can uh, that range can extend to kilometers um, so multi mode is your more traditional kind of usage uh, of your type of uh, optics single mode you're probably going to be experiencing that in a lot of broadcast environments and things like this uh, but you can have both um, on our systems so I've got the SD rack now uh, connected up uh, Fernando so now we're going to make things a bit differently, Tom, because before to discover that single rack, I just press confirm all ports, okay? Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, because we are only using one console, I'm going to show people what the button labeled single console does. So when I hit this button, two things will happen internally. The first thing, the console will interrogate the optical system and it will find what racks are connected. That's equivalent to press confirm all ports but after that automatically the system will do a remap which is going to be really easy because there's only one console so the system does, doesn't have to deal with multiple console setup so let me go there i'm going to press single console as you can see this is asking me uh that it's gonna it might affect the audio while you do this obviously this is the first setup so it's obvious that it does that and you can see it's populating my console with the racks Okay, once it's finished, it will do the remap and off you go. I can see now my mini rack and my SD rack. Okay, we are going to take this one step further and uh, I'm going to delete those ports now because we are going to add an SD9 onto the loop. So when we add another console, you guys will see that single console button will not be available anymore. Normally, what I like to do is to open the System Diagnostics Optical tab because it will allow me to see what devices are connected to my loop. As you guys can see, now I have ID1 for my SD10 and suddenly I've got ID3 for my SD9. So there's two consoles sitting in the loop now. So if I go back now to my setup audio I.O., the single console is now grayed out. That's just because I've got two consoles, okay? So I'm going to have to manually do the conformal port, okay? And that's going to have to be done in both consoles because as you explained earlier, we do have to have the same racks in both inventories, okay? So I'm going to do that on my 10 and I'm going to do that on my 9. Okay, conformal port. And as you can see, the same rack have appeared now uh, and it's yeah it's great so I can now try to remap when I say try to remap it's because there are things you need to take into account okay first thing I will I would always recommend make sure your sampling rate is the same in both consoles otherwise assistance will not allow you to remap make sure yes make sure you have the same racks declared even if you are not using the rack, it has to be in your session. Okay, that's exactly why I just added all those racks to the SD9. So once I'm happy with that, I have allocated racks. I could then go and allocate cards for each console. But this is something we will be covering in depth in our next video. For now, as promised, I will just press remap. And as you can see, this is something you only need to do in one of the consoles because it's not affecting individual units, it's the entire system that I'm remapping. And now, as you can see, so it's always good to have a bit of communication between your, your team, isn't it, at that point, just to make sure that only one console is pressing it at a time, really? Isn't it, it is, exactly. Obviously, there will be lots of consoles, as a, in the example we gave originally, there were five consoles in the loop. So, yes, normally I would say, uh, before everything is organized, one person is pointed out as the person who will be remapping all the time. Also on the audio page, once it is all mapped and all the desks are seeing all the racks and each other, for example, it's important to press that lock optical button, isn't it, Fernando? That lock optical button will allow me to uh, mix with the safety that no one's gonna change the allocation allocations of cards within the system so and that's something you can do in for each of the consoles so I can lock my SD10 
and I can lock my SD9, which has got ID3. You can see the IDs 1 and 3 are locked. So, yes, it's a way to uh, add another extra layer of security. But we are not done, Tom. There was something very important that uh, we have to do now. Obviously, we have uh, two racks connected. We have two consoles. We will have to make sure everything is running the same clock. So, my next step will be to go to the setup. Go to the audio sync and make sure we are running OptiCore as our main clock. That has to be done in each of the consoles. So, for my 9, you can see on screen, audio sync, OptiCore. So, everything is synced to OptiCore, everything is mapped, every device knows what's happening on the loop. We are ready to go. Fantastic. So, as a little bonus add-on, what we're going to do now is we're just going to go connect up the SD Nano rack and we're going to go complete the audio loop with the SD9 because at the moment we are all just running in one direction. So this is again just demonstrating the flexibility and power of the optical system. We haven't even completed the loop yet but we're still seeing all of the information up on the screen. Another way or another reason to do it this way is to also demonstrate that you can actually set your clock and optical settings uh, at different stages of your setup. Obviously, probably at the very beginning, but if you are adding in extra racks, don't worry about it, you can do indeed. So, Fernando, give me a few minutes just whilst I go connect up the uh, SD Nano and uh, connect up the SD9. Well, if you do it. that, Tom, I can show our friends out there the diagnostic tab uh, with the optical details. And I will see the rack you're connecting now appearing on my list. And I've got a very nice indicator of the status of the loop and which two devices are not talking to each other. So as you can see now, you have connected the rack and suddenly an ID24 is appeared on my inventory. Okay, and I can see the loop is not closed between IDs24 and IDs number three. You can follow the mouse there, what I'm pointing out. You can see the error there and the error there. It's easy to identify where the loop is opened. Tom has just closed it, and I've got a full closed optic, uh, optical rig now. Obviously, we're going to have to add that extra, extra rack to our session. So we are going to press conform ports again. And that has to be done in both consoles. There you go. I've got my nano rack now. I'm going to go to my SD9. Press yes. There you go. I've got my nano rack on my SD9. All I've got to do now is remap because every time you disturb the audio IO with optical related things, the remapping will be necessary. That's important. Okay. So press remap. Press yes. And I will get rid of all the red letters and warnings. And when I close this, I'm all ready to go. So there we have it. That is three racks connected up to two desks and uh, the quick and efficient ways of setting this system up. Now there is a host of other things that we can be going into right now, but we're gonna say that all for our next episode where you can come join us again for the more advanced look at this setup. But apart from that, Fernando, I think we've uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything we wanted to cover there, haven't we? I think we are ready to start the show. Yes. Excellent, excellent. So I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as we have. Um, any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, and as I hope you have been throughout the video, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care from me, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. And stay safe.